Good evening, everyone. This is Chaitali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. The Union Budget 2022 was announced yesterday, and the whole nation was waiting anxiously to find out what is being presented at the Parliament for them. We at APU today are going to discuss the implications of the Union Budget on the defense sector of our country. To brainstorm this, we have in our chat room a full house today from the Crown Group of Industries. We have with us retired Vice Admiral Parasnath, AVSM, VSM, Group President and CEO of Crown Group. Vice Admiral Parasnath served the Indian Navy for 40 years before retiring as its Chief of Logistics. And during his career with the Navy, he held numerous challenging appointments on board ships and establishments, including the operational involvement in peacekeeping operations of Sri Lanka. Joining him is retired Commodore, Commodore Rakesh Anand. Commodore Rakesh Anand is currently heading the Mar Marine Group of uh, Crown Group. Uh, we know him as a former CMD of Mazagan Dock Shipbuilders. He is an Indian Navy veteran, and in the Navy, he has served on various captain ships. We also have with us Mr. Vivek Chandran. He is an avionics in engineer and has over 30 years of experience in the field of MRO, ROH, and indigenization of aviation assets held by the Indian defense aviation sector. And finally, we have Mr. Vikas Banga, who has over 20 years of experience in leading high growth businesses, business acquisitions, private equity investments, fundraising, and corporate finance. Welcome, sirs. It's a pleasure to have you all in our chat room today. And now I request our editor, Aviation and Defense Universe, Sangeeta Saxena, to take this very important discussion further. Thank you very much, Itali. And gentlemen, it's an extreme pleasure to have all of you here on the chat show with us. I think, you know, we when we started and we thought we had one person and I was telling Chitali that, uh, you know, it's going to be a very good discussion and... Uh, you know, the gentleman is ex-Navy. And now I realize, you know, that all four of you are real experts and it's going to be something our audience will just love. And uh, since we are here a day post the budget 2022, so sir, I begin with you. My first question, how was the defense budget? I think the whole nation has a first reaction, the way the share market zoomed, uh, that gives an indication somewhat uh, how the budget was. But definitely, uh, having known, having seen the priorities of the government of India, either it was COVID or healthcare or infrastructure, I'll focus more on to the defense budget, as you see. The defense budget, as the figures are available, there is approximately 10% increase. Uh, now, but real terms, the debate can be, it may not be as much. It's just about 2% of the GDP. But definitely considering the priorities of the nation, which I'm sure the planners uh, find, it is, I would feel it's fairly good. It's a challenging budget. And the focus of the budget is not something like knee-jerk reaction. They're looking at long-term infrastructure build-up and planned in such a way that over a period of time, we definitely move towards self-reliance, Atnirbhar, and the infrastructure comes up. Now, that on the specific, if you want to know something on the budget of a defense budget, it has, uh, as it is visible, this year, the government of India has said 68% of all capital acquisition are going to be from Indian industry. Last year it was 58%. Now they made it 68%. That means it's a big, big booster for the nation, for indigenous industry. Now, second is, another it's a very, very unique structure this time. And as a first react reaction when we saw the budget was that RD, DRDO has got part of the budget from the defense budget. And they have a substantial chunk at uh, research and development. And DRDO has been doing a lot of good work. 
But out of that also, now what they have done? Twenty-five percent of BRDO R&D budget, we will, will be given to MSME, to industry and academia, which indicates that actually the smaller players can also invest into R&D and do some research work and uh, development. So these are very few highlights. But at the same time, uh, anyway, next question probably you'll be you'll uh, being an army background. You have seen capital outlay of army has little gone down. Yes. But in case you have a question, we can discuss it. Right, sir. Absolutely. And uh, you know, actually, I want to understand. You know, it's very nice the Make in India and the Atmanirbhar Bharat is sounding very positive, and the budget definitely proves that. But what happens to the impending uh, imports, which are on the way in the pipeline or expected, and suddenly the budget for them becomes very less, you know. So what happens to all these foreign OEMs who set their shops in India? So uh, is the budget a little, uh, you know, sad for them? I would think so, because what happens, whatever is the already committed liability, what we call, like, let us say a submarine project or a ship project started five years ago. So every year, depending on the movement of work or the progress of work, they keep getting the money. That is not going to be affected anyway. That is government of India is duty bound to meet the requirements of that. So I'm sure that will be taken care of or they must have taken care of. The budget allocations are done. So any of the imports from abroad are not going to be affected. Second, all the big ticket work, which are in terms of technology or modernization or very high end equipment, probably imports will continue. The 68% the balance is there for capital uh, acquisition from abroad. And uh, most even Army, Navy, Air Force, if you see the structure of our capital acquisition or modernization, it's a very time consuming process. You can imagine a aircraft carrier takes nearly 15 years to build. So you have to cater for budget to 15 years you spread according to the movement. Similarly, submarines or aircraft acquisition. So in every, we take the example of tanks and uh, modernization. It takes years and years to build up. So I'm sure foreign OEMs are not going to be affected. Yes, where it is going to pinch them and definitely that now if they have to, they want to do business with India, it's a big spender of defense equipment. They will fo be forced to come to India, have a joint venture, have a joint partnership. They are not being stopped from making profit. But the intention is you come and work in India. And whatever is the joint venture agreement, either uh, SPV, they take the profit accordingly. But the technology comes into the country, the job comes into the country, the job opportunities for our youth increases. So these are the advantages going to be. But yes, to some extent, I'm sure uh, in a bigger way, foreign OEMs till they sink in and they know they will be definitely challenged for them. That is it. Right, right, sir. And you're very right. I think if that's the way it happens, it's a you know win-win for all of them. And uh, in addition to this, sir, what I wanted to understand from you was that uh, you know yesterday the finance minister said that there's going to be a major infrastructure development in the border areas, keeping especially the LAC in mind. You know, so does that give Crown Group an opportunity to uh, you know? get work under this program of the government of India? This was a very interesting question, I find, because one would not think of going to the border visa for the Indian Navy or the Crown Group. But yes, ma'am, I'll tell you, the way it is planned, and one goes into the details of Sagar Mala to another in for second parallel expressways coming up. Now, if you see the development of the expressway and uh, right from Rajasthan, Gujarat, Punjab, go up to Leh and go up to northern border across the border areas. Now, it's not a routine expressway. The quality of work that is coming up is tremendous. At every 50 miles, I mean, there are a total of uh, 25 helipads. Only in the Punjab and Gujarat, uh, Gujarat sector, they're going to come up. So that gives a boost to aviation. You'll have uh, aircraft landing, you'll have uh, helicopters landing. 
the movement of and in every field of communication but let us say anti drones you have to have security you have got total there are more than couple of thousand cctv cameras spread all across in this 600 kilometers almost over and it is so there is so much of technological development and requirement that uh, i feel crown group will have uh, tremendous opportunity particularly so that we have got such a wide base of activities going on either it is land forces will come in they have got opportunity aviation will have marine maybe to limited action but electronics will be playing a big role so that's how i look at it uh, in the border areas uh, development and uh, in continuation to this sir when you say electronics uh, will that also mean that uh, you will have some foray into uh, you know manufacturing uh, and assembling of uh, artificial intelligence equipment yes artificial intelligence as i said uh, that was part of our it wing but on electronics like kamaro anand is uh, sitting here he is in mumbai and heading that particular uh, activity the factory of ours in fact he is he overall head of marine but on ypl i would uh, pass it on to him to say how the electronics opportunity comes into army and air force rakesh yeah so uh, you see we have started the uh, weapon systems uh, repairs just a year back and uh, successfully executed a large number of uh, So weapon system modules, uh, you know, which have been repaired already, and the uh, uh, you see there is a lot of commonality in the weapon systems. The basic uh, fundamentals they don't change across the board between the three services. So once we have done it for the Indian Navy, uh, you know, we can spread out and look at it in the Army and the Air Force also. there would be some nuances which are very typical for the two but by and large about 70 per to 80 percent is is common complexity compactness apart you know those would be the uh, areas that one would probably have to look at and therefore uh, the capabilities that we are creating would definitely come in for uh, very very handy for all the three services having uh, begun with the indian navy we are very sure that we will be able to support and sustain uh, the, there is also a very important aspect the dual use of technology across the board and and uh, maintenance in duality also the capability generation if you don't if we don't uh, develop the skill sets uh, and you stick restricted to uh, the defense alone it becomes at times uh, you know you tend to stagnate very fast you need to spread out and i think so that is what we have done and we are looking out to find uh, business volumes in the civil areas on electronics so that you know that uh, you are well diversified a well, very well rounded uh, portfolio as also look at the army and the air force also will be able to achieve that and i'm sure the revenue generation from this sector will always grow and electronics we all are aware is a sunrise sector today in every field every arena civil use defense you can't sustain without uh, electronics and i think to be a little more specific on the kind of opportunities that we are looking at Uh, on the border front one is the drones and the anti drones so you know we have developed some anti drone handheld gun which has undergone trials with the army before uh, we are looking at expanding that range and one of the key things you know that we as a crown group focus on is to really do technology tie ups with the foreign players you know so that we are able to bridge that technology gap that exists while we continue to focus on r and d i think it's a quick idea to really do those tie ups and bridge that gap also uh, so similarly we're looking at doing these tie ups in this both these spaces especially on the artificial intelligence side you know we have uh, done a tie up with an indigenous player where we are looking at providing all surveillance uh, you know which can take care of uh, which is takes care of a connected system through which you can do camera surveillance you can do surveillance on the internet um, and bring out intelligent output 
for any agency. So that is one of the key focus that is there through our IT company for the group. So. Right, absolutely. Now, this is very enlightening, you know, actually, if you see, I mean, we when uh, we sat down, I sat down with this impression, you know, that uh, it's going to be limited to, you know, two or three and majorly marine. And now I realize and, uh, you know, our very major focus is, is on military aviation and MRO for military aviation. And like Commodore Anand said, that it can also be dual use. Uh, aviation has always had a you know, dual use when it came to MROs. Now, how was yesterday's budget for this sector? The MRO, MRO is a big industry as far as, the, as far as India is concerned. Right at the moment, yes, it is for the civil aviation that the uh, MRO industry sounds quite big enough. Whereas the defense sector, the MRO industry is, I should say, a bit small at the given time. But with the budget which has now been released, uh, the kind of opportunity that has op opened up for the Indian defense MRO sector is so big that I feel if the MRO industry takes it up on a very serious note, right from MRO, we would be very soon, you know, stepping into developing the same kind of product, which right now we are looking towards from, of importing from, you know, from abroad. And the MRO is, uh, in fact, it's only now when we start to start talking to the customers, we know that the customers have, you know, literally been starving uh, for want of such indigenous MRO service providers. They have been always uh, under the impression that you know, the most reliable uh, MRO service, if you want, you need to look up from outside. But now with India's MRO, defense MRO sector opening up, which is being highly enabled by the budget which has now come up, I'm sure that you're going to find a lot of uh, uh, startups also coming up, including people like us who are already in this business of MRO for the last uh, 30, 35 odd years. We also find a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities uh, that is uh, definitely going to be coming up our way in uh, making the uh, in, under the Make in India and also under the Art and the Butter. And see, uh, for, uh, for, for aerospace, do you have uh, your tie ups already with some foreign OEMs or is it absolutely indigenous? No, we have we already have tie up with Russian OEMs for the defense MRO, we have tie up with the French. Uh, companies for the defense uh, uh, aviation. Uh, aviation. We also have with the Israeli aerospace industry uh, of Israel, uh, ongoing tire which is running for the last uh, since uh, year 2010 onwards. So we already have all these uh, OEM tires in uh, motion at the uh, given time. But now with the Make in India concept coming up, the kind of cooperation or the kind of uh, you know, um, the, the, the way we are going to operate with them are going to be more uh, demanding, you know, like we have got now the need or the power to actually talk to them to give us more. Ah, yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, which uh, one sector in addition to this, which I feel, you know, that it's the biggest force in the country, but uh, saw a setback in the budget yesterday. Uh, the, for the Indian Army. Now, I want to understand from you, sir, as far as Crown Group is concerned, uh, what do you have for the Indian Army, keeping in mind the current geopolitical scenario in which the Indian Army is absolutely tied down on two and a half borders front? Yeah, there, there no doubt. In fact, uh, Indian Army has been tied up and two and a half is the right uh, uh, borderline. Problems have been a little different uh, in, again, balancing the forces. Now, government has started serious, unfortunately, a little setback, but it's very important for now having the concept of joint warfare. Now, army, we are all borders are maximum is the, we have got hostile borders on west and north. Army, army is definitely preoccupied in full measure, and it remains so. Air Force across the country. Now, what is the role of Navy comes in? Um, uh, 
like uh, i'll take you back to cargill operations uh, navy on the face of it navy had uh, no role it was cargill was purely army and air force but when what has come into public domain already all that navy did place their submarines their assets off karachi harbor and declared some sort of unofficial blockade that means any trade coming through merchant ships their insurance cost went up 23 24 times and virtually the economy of pakistan started dwindling now that is coming to the current scenario to fine northern borders whatever activities on seas chinese pressure is there western border is nibbling the other half internal okay we can uh, leave it separately with police and other uh, paramilitary forces but naval force the only way navy can or india can put pressure on chinese is through south china sea like see the malacca strait that's the choke point and all trade from gulf via southern tip of india sri lanka goes through the malacca strait and the bordering countries of south china sea like it is vietnam philippines japan all across and that's where the foreign policy of india has been to create friendship and have friendly relations with them now philippines you have seen brahmos has been uh, sold to philippines i mean they are our partners so the way we can put pressure on you okay fine if something serious happens we have our assets fully supported in the china sea and you have got weapon systems which is uh, full range so that is where navy now coming to if it is budget is a balancing act i'm sure uh, it's not that government has not realized that army but one of the inputs i got see again last year before last year the capital ex- budget is very difficult to spend maybe commitment is there but at times the work doesn't progress so the budget is held on probably that could be the reason that this capital outlay they've reduced that of uh, army and enhanced for navy because naval assets are still way behind what is supposed to be we are supposed to have 175 ship uh, navy but we are nowhere secondly the environment of naval activities is definitely under challenge and today you come it so it's just that i'm sure that the planners must have balanced it but on the face of it a lot of people ask question why the army's budget has gone down but that is on capital and uh, as you know i'm an army is more manpower intensive that means the revenue budget on pay and allowances and is bound to be high in fact i if i recollect uh, army's uh, revenue budget it is nearly 63 or percent somewhere around that navy is much the navy is the only service where the revenue budget on pay allowances maintenance of troops is well below 50% so still the navy has got more to spend from capital so these are balancing act and uh, a lot of media comes on pension bill or so i mean it's unavoidable we have to manage after all your troops are across the board they retire so early they still have the family liability they've got all unless we give them job they are all willing to work till 60 years but if you say that no i need to maintain a young army and retire them at 40 years 42 years we have to support them otherwise they go into wrong direction so revenue budget when somebody discusses on pay allowances i think is more for hype it is just we have to accept it part of our expenditure absolutely sir and uh, you know where the high point yesterday was Uh, research and development sir yeah. and uh, does that give uh, the crown group an opportunity to expand its already existing r&d facilities uh, do you think there uh, there's a business case in this uh, announcement by the finance minister for companies like yours sir definitely it's the first time as i mentioned in the beginning and this is the first time 25% r&d budget has come to the industry <clears throat> and when we look at industry in particular smes the small medium uh, entrepreneurs they have got very little capacity to put their own money in r&d is a fact 
they are on day to day providing support services and survival but this kind of or tying up with academia and we have recently got a going with what the university amrita. amrita university we have signed a research r&d partnership not knowing that budget will come but definitely for crown group as well now we can look at in particular when we want to indigenize equipments either from uh, various base uh, depots of air force or naval uh, arms equipments or fitments in the ships so this is definitely going to give us a uh, benefit to the crown group as well as the rest of it and sir uh, you know we come to uh, discussions and post discussions and also suggestions so what is this sort of suggestion you would like to give you know for Uh, make it india atmanirbhar bharat and of course you know for making india a big manufacturing power uh, we can just hope you know uh, yes. in the world yes. where we, where are tie ups with companies like yours you know when it's a private sector when ties up with uh, the other countries is a bigger achievement government sector can always tie up you know the intergovernmental tie ups have always been there so uh, what are the suggestions you would give you know so that it improves all these three factors it was very interesting uh, part of the whole discussion because policy guidance are good budget allocation how do you implement it and uh, i don't mind saying that we are very good at making policy letters but bad at execution the feeling is that looks like government is serious on now this has been serious when it comes to what we need now i'll give you example let us say there is a small scale industry or whatever turnover of 10 crore 15 crore or 50 crores he still struggling to survive and build up now in defense sector the uncertainty of getting the order today for example we win a you know roughly it is always uh, multiple tenders then you have to be l1 lowest one quote the negotiation then you get the contract now let us say we invest it i invest x amount of money in a particular factory but i am not certain whether the order is going to come so it's a catch 22 situation i wait for the order then create infrastructure or create take a chance even if you get the order first time second time you don't know what will happen two years later as such defense equipments the pure hardcore ones they have got very little uses outside so the industry is if it is only focused on defense equipment is tied to this that is one suggestion and very strong suggestion of mine would be if government could identify whatever let us say i am good at making a item you assure me that for 5 years you will get this kind of order you fix the price have your checks and balances have a but let me produce it give it serve it For five years, seven years, little long-term uh, planning, that will go a long way in building the confidence and also investors to come in and invest uh, into the business. That is one major recommendation and of course policy guidelines on uh, okay following up thrust. It has to the message has to go down at hooking level that this kind of orders on indigenization on R and D simpler routes which are coming up. but far more aggressive effort required to really enter into and uh, to provide a little more uh, facility to the industry to be able to move ahead right and so before we uh, you know wind up it's such a lovely discussion you know that uh, you want to we wanted to continue but the fact is that uh, we really want to uh, ask you one thing before uh, we say bye is that have you identified high growth regions in the world and how do you plan to expand you know i'm just just very briefly because when we talk about it at a different platform with a defense show next uh, next month we'll talk more about it but at the moment with this budget how do you identify that yes there could be expansions in high growth regions of the world rakesh dega uh high growth regions of the world uh what do you imply by the high growth regions regions of the world what you know there imply? are uh, we know when we talk of expansion we talk of you know regions uh, which are already expanded you know we talk of the first world countries we've got you know we our tie ups are always with countries which are uh, you know uh, great and strong 
but when we want to think of tie ups where we have the upper hand you know such regions the world is full of such regions okay the world is full of such regions madam we all know that the whole of europe uh, you know if you identify any hardware ship aircraft uh, army land systems the lower end of technology is given off to the so called no longer existing third world countries they are not third world, third world countries let's say for a very long time anchor anchor cable chain cable the europeans would send it to india or china say you manufacture this and give it to us so you remain engaged in labor intensive activities not focusing on niche high technology areas and i put my manpower and resources in developing the high and niche technology areas and i charge you 100 times more than what it has costed me in giving you those equipment and to deny those technologies to to you and i may build the entire platform and give it off to you to the so called again the third world countries at a phenomenal rate this has been the policy of the whole of europe all this while and therefore it is it is we have to leap frog you know from doing all these mundane routine things and we don't let them remain give, you know you got to bridge that gap which which we, which has been created over all these years and we need to look at the highest end of niche technologies in our country there is no doubt the answer to your question is that yes europe is they have look at france look at germany look at these people have taken a, you know an edge over us all all these years by you know in putting so much of resources into into technology that we have been left behind it ta- it will take some time but this is where with the impetus being given by the government this is what they want to do it will have double benefits the spin offs one is employment will increase in the country which is so much required after the covid the government is seized of this aspect of unemployment and they they are looking at ways and means of generating employment so if we start doing make in india it will have benefits twofold look at technologies new technologies start manufacturing them here if they want to come in and do that business here with india i think it is high time that we tell the whole world that now it is going to be made in india or made for india or made by india you know it's that time is over that we'll make it and send it sell it to you with, with your mundane c category items put on the ship or the platforms and i give you the high patient and uh, you leverage on uh, that aspect and therefore the message is very clear to the whole world with this budget the government is very serious about it to do make in india and to bridge this high end niche it will take some time but i think we are on the right track to remove them from that status of you know where things are happening things should now be happening in india the way the things are being done now right we are on a growth path highest gdp 9% right it's going to be there for some time despite all the covids so we will be able to plow in a lot of funds into defense and if that money comes into the you know uh, in, into the country itself we will have uh, greater employment disposable incomes will increase it will have spin offs of better economy macro economics of the nation will improve and i think this is the way to go we are on the right track absolutely time. absolutely so positive to hear this and uh, i think thank you very much sirs all four of you for being there explaining it so beautifully to us and a sector you know which is absolutely expanding and uh, i think you know this talk will continue when we meet next uh, before def expo and talk more about what was going to happen there i think we can now uh, you know after thanking you we are now taking you back to cyprus which atali is waiting for us to wind up the show for us uh, handed over to you chatali thank you so much ma'am thank you so much sir it was very important for us to get the industry perspective on the defense budget which you all gave us and i'm sure it is going to be a very 
interesting thing for our audience to listen to you all and all the suggestions that you have given to us. Thank you so much. And we are really looking forward to have another session with you before Def Expo, which I'm sure we'll uh, do it soon. Thanks again, gentlemen, for your time. As I know, you all are very busy, but still, you took out time for our ADU. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Pleasure meeting you both. And uh, very nice, very, very uh, enlightening uh, you know, discussion. And uh, well, look forward right. to meeting again. All right. Absolutely, sir. Right. Bye -bye. Have a nice day. Jai Hind. Bye.